We live in a time where masculinity is shamed and men don't know what it means to be a man. As a pastor and counselor, I've spent the better part of my life equipping and training others. My goal with this show is to translate my hard-earned experience into tools and tactics to help you become stronger as a man. This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bellows. All right, Brave Co. men, welcome back to the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm here with a friend of mine, Steve Doubledam. Steve is the CEO and founder of Wilderness Collective. And um, you guys are going to hear a lot about what they do, the adventures uh, that Steve puts together and takes guys on. But Steve, thanks so much, man, for jumping on today. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, happy to be here, man. It's great to see you again. Steve, would you t- tell me a little bit about Wilderness and what you guys do? And, and we'll dive into kind of how you got started in it. Yeah, sure. So at, at a high level, um, we put together trip of a lifetime experiences for people that are a mix of power sports. So that's, you know, off-road motorcycles or four wheelers, UTVs, off the grid camping, incredible food with a private chef, uh, just world-class storytelling with a photographer and videographer on board. So it's this great mix of in some parts of the trip, you're roughing it. At other parts of the trip, you're definitely not roughing it, you know, but it's this big disconnection for people. They're usually four day long trips. We take people's phones away. Uh, we've been doing that for over a decade. And so the whole experience is really designed to be kind of a mile marker in your life. Um, you know, people come on the trips for all kinds of reasons that are much bigger than I wanted to ride a motorcycle. Yeah. And so our goal is to help them figure that out during the experience of just having an adrenaline filled incredible weekend. Dude, that is awesome. That sounds amazing. Um, getting guys in the woods is, it, it's something we do at Brave Co as well. We do some uh, long range shooting schools and a couple of adventure trips. Um, not quite, I don't think, uh, we don't do quite as off grade as you guys do in some of the stuff. Um, what's like, what's the most popular clip that you guys do? <laughs> Yeah, our best selling trip that sort of started the whole business is a four day off road motorcycle ride from the southern part of Sierra National Forest all the way through the National Forest up to Yosemite. It ends in Yosemite Valley. So that's our all time best seller. Um, but we've got all kinds of other trips now. We've kind of branched out beyond that. But that's really where it all started and it remains uh, one of the best trips. I've done it so many times and it's still one of my favorites. How did you guys start? Like what, what was the big idea behind taking guys on adventures? Yeah, I, honestly, the big idea was I had helped my wife get a women's media company called Darling off the ground. We were publishing a magazine. We were doing all this great work for women and women's identity and kind of through the lens of this media landscape and a magazine. And I was moving out of one career and looking to do something new. And I had a vision for having a conversation with men, primarily about modern masculinity through the lens of adventure. And so I was always the I'm Canadian, I live in LA, but I was always the wild Canadian, like getting all my friends on these like crazy adventures being like, I bought a boat for 500 bucks, let's sail it to the Channel Islands, like what could go wrong. Um, So that's just like who I was to my friend group. And it filled up our cups and our hearts and souls so much to spend a couple of days with each other when we're all busy entrepreneurs and the emotional and relational benefit from that experience, it was magnified, I think because of a lot of reasons, but essentially that's what adventure does, right? Adventure, especially for men opens you up in kind of a new way that allows you to go really deep. It allows you to, you know, make discoveries about yourself and the people you care about. So like there was so much good stuff happening in these trips I was doing with my friends. And then I had this vision to have a conversation with men about modern masculinity through adventure. And so I put those pieces together and thought, well, everybody wants to do it, but nobody wants to put it together, right? A trip falls apart in the details. And so I was like, okay, if we can manage the details, if we can provide a really world-class hospitality experience and make it easy for people to say yes to this, um, you know, then 
then we might have something here, right? It's that old adage of if it's good for you, it might be good for other people. So it was good for me. So I wanted to make it easy for other people to experience the upside that I was experiencing. And that is what led to it. And we, the very first trip was a test trip with all my buddies. Uh, we shot a film on that trip. Some really talented friends of mine shot a film that kind of captured it. It was almost like our manifesto. And we put that out to the world. This was back when things could go viral. And, you know, the film basically went viral. I had half the internet who thought it was the greatest thing they've ever seen. Half the internet thought it was the dumbest thing they've ever seen. And, you know, either way, all press is good press, right? And so it helped us fill the first couple public trips that weren't with my friends. And then slowly, brick by brick, very humble beginnings. I've been building a business ever since. And that was uh, 11 years ago. So we're on our 11th year right now. Man, it's incredible. I've followed you guys. Um, I've followed you guys for quite a long time, uh, social media, and then also watching your videos and stuff. And I think the model that you guys have put together and just pioneering that outdoor adventure for the man who wants to kind of um, have an epic adventure, but also unplug and unwind from society. It's just, you guys have just done an incredible job, the top notch um equipment the top notch filming the chefs all that is like it's so yeah. genius right because it, it's yeah. what it's what all of my guy friends want they want a top notch experience <laughs> in a way yeah. that they can un- yeah. they don't have to plan it but they can they can basically you know buy an adventure and and have a have something that's really unique so you guys have yeah. just done yeah. such a cool job with that um Thanks, man. one one question i do have for you is <clears throat> um, when these guys come on the trips, like what is a common bond that you see as far as like, what's the biggest hurdle these guys are facing and have to overcome? <clears throat> hmm. Yeah. I think after having, I mean, more than like 3000 people come through our doors, right? Mm-hmm. What you start to realize is that everybody's dealing with the same few problems Um, and those problems usually are coming from people getting out of balance in their life, right? So they've made work too much of a priority that their family is suffering, or they haven't made work enough of a priority. So they actually can't provide for their family in a way they had hoped to at this point in life. Um, maybe their personal and spiritual development used to be a priority in their life and that landscape has changed for them and they're trying to figure out how do I get this in balance, right? If I think about the people whose lives I want to emulate, I would say they're people who are in balance. Yeah. Um, that idea of avoiding all extremes, right? So we see, I mean, the big one is work, right? Work is a great replacement for your identity as a man. And so you go to work you pour all your best energy into work and you get results there and you don't get results elsewhere in your life if that's where you're pouring it all. So that's the predominant one. Um, I mean, it's sad. So many of the people who come through, you know, are one or two marriages deep already and they're in their 30s or 40s. Um, That's really common. So you see a lot of broken families and you see guys trying to put those pieces back together, um, whether that's figuring out how do they do life now with, you know, a new wife, an ex-wife with kids, with kind of a, you know, a disparate family set up. Um, so that's pretty common as well. Um, but yeah, I would say the word to, to sum it all, it's balance. Like, I think that is the, that's the through line for sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I feel like that is the same type of thing. Like, we do uh we do tons of stuff with men as well of course it's it's our whole focus is discipleship and and whether we do a conference or whether we do an event we always do discipleship after it or yeah. offer discipleship and it's crazy i always say this like 9 out of 10 guys i meet are super lonely don't have anybody in their corner with them and um like you would say like are just so far out of balance and it, it just feels like yeah. so many men are suffering today um from that same thing uh, how have you like what's your remedy to that so our hypothesis and remedy is that we were made for a rhythm of adventure hmm. right so 
if you come on a wilderness trip and your life is all out of whack, we hope that it's like a big wake up call that it like snaps you back to reality. It reminds you what it feels like to be alive again. Like get the crap kicked out of you on the dirt bike, get bruised, get cut, sleeping on the dirt in a tent, having the best meal of your life, sleeping under the stars, like just feeling alive and having fun. Cause a lot of dudes are bad at having fun in healthy ways. Yeah. And so if that kickstarts it, my hope for people is that they develop and cultivate a rhythm of adventure in the rest of their life. So that can look like once a month, I've got something on the calendar that I'm excited about, whether it's something I've never done before, something I love to do, something that I'm doing with someone, you know, adventure looks like all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be, I'm not saying you need to book a trip with us every month, you know what I mean? But it's like what, what an adventure is like, okay, there is some unknown in there. You're doing something you've never done before. You're going somewhere you've never been before, or you're doing it with someone that you've never spent time with before. Like part of what makes an adventure an adventure is the unknown. Like very much on purpose. We hide a lot of details from our clients about what we're going to be doing. Like you'll, you can try and push us for the plan of the day or the itinerary. It's pretty loose because we want you to experience it firsthand not to be counting down the miles until we get to the cool lunch lookout. Um, Cause that's what we do in the rest of our life. So yeah, a rhythm of adventure I think is one antidote for this. And then obviously you do that to get healthy yourself. So you can give out of that place of health and strength and stability to those around you. And then I think that's where you start to get it back in balance. That's interesting. Um, I, I work with a lot of guys who just struggle with all kinds of addictions, you know, sexual addictions. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they, they often get really good at checking the boxes on, okay, like I'm checking in with myself, um, hanging out with friends. Um, I'm, you know, learning how to connect emotionally with my wife, whatever. Yeah. But there's, a there's this piece that I feel like most guys miss and it is the adventure piece. And I was talking with a good friend of mine who also runs a men's ministry. And I've been, um, I've helped him for a really long time, just personally. And the other day, uh, I was asking him how he's doing. He said, man, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, but I've been struggling a ton with temptation lately. And which temptation is not a horrible thing, right? Like Jesus was tempted in every way. It's just a sign that you've got a bunch of needs that, that need to be met. And he's kind of the guy that's like, he's really on it. You know, he's got a lot of stuff together and he's, he's been doing this for so long, but I was like, bro, when's the last time you went on an adventure? Yeah. What's your routine for adventure? Yeah. And it, it just kind of stopped him because he, you know, he's going back to like, man, am I experiencing so much temptation because I'm not connected to my wife or because, you know, I'm bored or because I'm lonely or, but when you, when you really get down to it, I'm like, bro, if you don't have a regular routine for getting out of your comfort zone, experiencing something completely new, um, yeah. like exploring, we have such a, such a deep desire for the unknown in exploration that I feel like without that piece in our lives, it, it really does everything else really does get so far out of whack. And I yeah. know like for me, um, I dealt with anxiety a lot, especially like uh, 2009, <laughs> to like 2018, I did eight years of, in 2009, I had a nervous breakdown and <clears throat> just, it just basically took me out um, yeah. emotionally, mentally, physically. And one of the best ways that I ended up learning how to manage and regulate my nervous system was through adventures, through fly fishing mostly. Yeah. Um, and it's like being able to get out onto the water and get outside of my head and be pushed to the limits in, in different areas of my life was like, I don't know, it just brought so much healing and is now my go-to that I throw in on a regular basis. On a regular basis, I can grab my fly rod or I can grab my bow and, or I can, I'm, I was supposed to go to Alaska, um, uh, next week actually to go, go chase caribou and, uh, moose, but, um, I'm having to move that trip cause I got to, I'm my mother-in-law's she's not well. So, mm -hmm. but 
throwing and sewing in adventure into my life has been like a massive way that I feel like uh, I bring myself back to normal. And I yeah. think right, like so many guys are missing that piece. Yeah. 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 One way that I talk about it with people, you know, a question I like to ask people is like, these kind of mid middle age guys, I don't know. Are we middle aged? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think we are. <laughs> um, is like, what are your hobbies? And it's a sad question to ask people because a lot of people, they really don't have a good or compelling answer, you know, or they don't have an abundance of hobbies and a lack of time to do all of them. That's my problem. I, you know, but what, that points to and how I'll talk to you guys about this is like, you know, what charged your batteries up enough to get you to the point where you're at now? Like you need, you've depleted that. You need that again, right? In your early twenties, you were adventuring, you were doing stuff, you were doing like, you were just doing everything. And that kind of charged up your spirit enough And then you get into the next phase of life, whether that's marriage or raising kids or starting a business. And that's a, it's hard and you've got to focus. You've got to, it takes tunnel vision to move that needle ahead. But then if you grind for too long in that direction and you kind of forget the spice of life things, right? Like the things that gave you the energy in the first place to want to do this stuff, then all of a sudden you've kind of, you've got no well to draw from anymore. And so that's why like, one of my very favorite things is when guys come on our trips, they got no business being on a motorcycle really. Um, and then after the trip, they're like, their brain is like on fire. They go back home, they buy a motorcycle and they're just riding that sucker every week. And there's a whole new part of them has woken up. That's just a good, healthy thing. You know, dude, I think that's so true. I, I always say like anytime you're, outflow goes beyond your inflow, exceeds your inflow. Like we end up bankrupt, right? Like you spend more money than you're bringing in, you exert more emotional energy than you're bringing in. And I think one of the ways that we really do recharge emotionally, I was talking about this yesterday. Like if I'm super emotionally uh, empty, if I'm like stressed out, the way that I fill that back up is through exercise or adventure or getting, getting out, doing something physical. Yeah. And, um, but we do, we live in a world today where most men, they, they have never experienced that before. Most men that wasn't modeled for them. You know, their dads weren't doing that. And and I think too, like most men are so caught up in their work world, building that success, you know, trying to climb the ladder of success that you're right, man, we we totally forget what brought us, what gave us the energy in, in the beginning, what, what, what made life fun and worth living. And it's so easy to end up in your fifties without any way to have an, a real outlet. I often yeah. ask guys the same question. I was asking a guy yesterday, dude, what's your hobbies? And he said, he said the same thing. I don't have a hobby. And so I started to tell him like, dude, a hobby is an investment into your future. Like if you learn golf or you learn fly fishing or you learn bow hunting or you learn how to ride a motorcycle, like that's a, that is something that will continue to feed you for the rest of your life that so many guys yeah. just as a waste of time. But man, it's hard to live a healthy life without having that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, what's the biggest challenge that you feel like you face on a regular basis right now as a man? Um, I think, let me think about that. Good question. I think it's, it's what I was saying before. I think probably the the one of the harder things is still finding balance, right? So it's, I've got young kids and they demand a lot of my time. And then I've got this high value for having a balanced life where I've got commit time to like my hobbies, do the things that make me come alive. And then, you know, I also want to give the best of myself to my wife and be present to my business, but not be like, you know, 
too yeah. focused on it. So it is balancing those things is is a challenge. And I definitely am not perfect at it all the time, you know. And I think when when it gets kind of out of whack, you know, you're then you don't give the best of yourself to, you know, those around you. Um, so that's, that's one thing that just feels like kind of like the daily thing that is like, okay, I don't know. There's not some like magic, but I think it's just a practice thing. Right. And, and life changes, you know, it's like what worked last month isn't maybe going to work this month for our family rhythm or, you know, I'm really feel fortunate to have a lot of flexibility in my life, um, because of my work and because of, you know, Sarah works for herself as well. She's got a little bit less flexibility. Um, cause I, I think it would be even harder for me if I was in a position that was really rigid. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one challenge for sure. And then I think here and there, like not right now, well, it could be right now, I guess there's, there's always enough things in my business that can spark real fear. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really deal with anxiety too much unless it's maybe like warranted and there's something like really big in front of my face, but you know, we're having a great year with the business, but at the same time, like there's some stuff on the, you know, kind of the business management side on the back end where, you know, where we're like, oh man, if this, if X, Y, and Z happens, then all of a sudden all our hard work is going to like be for nothing this year and making the business more healthy. And so there's this, like life is just trying to like draw you into worry and you, I have to sometimes work harder than other times to like, to draw a line, to say like, I'm not going to give into that. I'm going to put this fear where it can be like, all I can do is my best. And then I've just got to trust for the rest of it. You know, it's the only option, you know? And so it's, even though I've been at it for 11 years and ridden all the waves, yeah. you still tell yourself a story that is fear-based about the future. Um, so there's that. And then sometimes I think comparison can creep in on that. You know, if you spend too much time thinking about your friends' businesses or your competitors or looking at like, that's the worst. I, I try really hard to not do that. Um, but that one can always get in there too. For anyone who's doing anything, you're like, oh man, like well, it can be the dumbest things that plant a seed in your head. Um, you know, so I re I try pretty hard to live out of a posture of contentment and gratitude because I just, I have so much to be grateful for. Like I do, there's no way I don't, even if I'm facing really scary stuff with maybe lots of zeros attached to it, like, okay. But then if you zoom out a bit more, you're like, yeah, life is still really good. Yeah. You know? Dude, uh, I mean... Yeah, I think you hit the the three like super common things that all of us men are facing, which is yeah, welcome to to normal life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Um have you found like some big keys of success in those? I mean, I know that although they may, may be the the biggest challenges you face, like mm. I think the balancing work life is obviously a grind that every man's doing and yeah. Success just breeds often just breeds more um, uh, greater challenges in that, right? Because if you, yeah. if you encounter success then that opens up opportunity and good opportunities yeah. are hard to pass up and, you know, yeah. your business builds, more people want to do it. And, you know, it's just a bigger beast. Like how have you yeah. and Sarah, especially um, like really work through that aspect of, of her having, you know, darling and you having wilderness, like how have you guys worked mm -hmm. more through that flow? Yeah, I, I think a few things that have, you know, first on the like the what helps me front is um like you mentioned it that I'm trying to not really reduce the stress in my life, but because a bigger life brings bigger stress with it, but change my relationship with stress, mm. right? So how do I reframe it and say, okay, like this is, if I'm, if I keep pushing, like you keep saying yes to stuff and you keep, you know, tackling big things, there's going to be pressure that comes with that. So how do you change your relationship with that and see that stuff not as debilitating? So that's one. Um, another thing that has helped me personally with the, like 
the balance, the rhythm of the adventure stuff. A friend of mine had this concept and it stuck with me. It's, you know, cheat on work, not on your family, right? Mm. So like on Fridays, I get my stuff done so that I can take four or five hours off during the day. Kids are at school, Sarah's at work. So that then on the weekend, I'm not trying to fit in like a big epic mountain bike ride or a dirt bike ride or something like that. So I would much rather shortchange my business than my family in that. And ultimately, I find it actually more relaxing too, because it's not very relaxing to me if on a Saturday, you know, Saturday's prime time at the family and you're like, hey, babe, like, I want to go on a bike ride. And it's like, all right, I'll be back by 1030. And then you're like out there in the middle of nowhere and you're like, oh, crap, I'm not going to be back by 1030. Like, you're just watch. It's, It's different. Like, what you need is like open time. To be like, I'm feeling good. I'm going to keep going, or I'm I'm tired. I'm going to go to the coffee shop, just hang out by myself, you know. So that's been a really good rhythm that I've actually really tried hard to in, bring into my life is um, making some time for myself on Fridays. Usually, um, that's been good. As a family, I mean, Sarah is busier than I am now. Um, you know, we've both been entrepreneurs for our entire, you know, almost twelve years of marriage. So we've gotten good at the feeling of uncertainty. Um, We've been able to help each other throughout certain seasons and times. And we really work as a team. I think that we, we pretty much co-parent, you know, so like we're definitely tackling the family stuff together um, because I respect what she's doing just as much as she respects what I'm doing. Um, And we try to be diplomatic when it comes down to like travel schedules and like, well, you've got this thing. And I'm like, well, I got this thing. And it's, they're equally important. Like who's going to win here? Um, Whereas, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, if your wife isn't quote working, it can be easy for them to like, kind of get pushed aside. And you're like, well, I got this thing and I got to do it, you know, and I've got to do this. So in some ways, maybe it does, it has helped provide some of that balance to us because I can't, I can't really play that card to myself because then I might be traveling more than I'd want to be or saying yes to more than I'd want to. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that for both of us, you know, yeah, it's just working hard to, to keep that spirit of like partnership alive, you know, and, um, you know, we don't like keep score. Keeping score is a terrible idea. Um, but you do need your like your lanes, you know, and you do need to have an understanding of like what need, what needs to happen for this for this whole thing to work. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I think so many marriages have never really learned how to do teamwork, and um, I think that so many people struggle in marriage because they uh, have never figured out the rhythm of the reentry, how to come back home, how to be present, you know, how, how to do the win-win with work or business or whatever. And, um, I think that that is for, for a man, that is one of the secrets to having a healthy life is learning how to do real partnership and real teamwork inside of the marriage. Mm-hmm. Cause it can get, yeah. I think a lot of guys feel incompetent at home. And even what, even when the kids are young, I think that was one of the ways that Lauren and I built a really successful marriage uh, is when we started having the the little babies. Um, she knew that I could do everything from nap time to cooking to all of it. And so when I came home, I was actually like a really good partner instead of like, yeah, what do I do here? And we sat down and, and like we made it a point to watch um, quite a bit of e-courses on you know, the, especially when the babies were really young, like in getting them through those, the sleep phases and and not sleeping what's happening. And I think a lot of guys miss, miss that aspect. And then the only place that they feel really successful is at work. Yeah. And so it's so compelling to go back to work, stay in that place of work because I don't feel super successful, you know, in, in that partnership, I feel really successful in my other partnerships at work. And so, and I love yeah. you guys, that, that you guys are doing that and have kind of been forced to do that in a way because she's both an entrepreneur and a parent and so are you. So that that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I tell like any friends who are like about to become a father or something like that, you know, I was, I saw two things basically. The, the first one is, yeah, that 
learn everything from day one because then you can actually help your wife. You can set her free. She can go out for the weekend. She can leave for four days, you know, like otherwise she's just chained to it, you know? And so it's, I think it's really critical to show up at the beginning so that you understand how to be helpful and that you feel like you can be successful too, you know? And then the other thing too, you know, cause I think guys bring a lot of fear into that sometimes. And I just tell them, you know what, like every day that your kid is a day older, they're like one day better being a human. And that's one day better that you are being a father. Yeah, so you're right. both grow. You're learning at the exact same pace, literally. So you don't need to be stressed out about it. You know, it's like, you just need to be like dad plus one tomorrow, you know, and there's this beauty in that, but like, you've got to be wanting to learn, you know, you can't turn that off because then all of a sudden, yeah, you get to a spot later in life where, like you said, you feel like you can't even show up or, you know, and I've got, I know guys who like can literally barely watch their kids for a weekend. And it drives me crazy. Like, I want to be like, dude, you better, you got to grow up. Like, come on. <laughs> like, ser- like, ser- I have little patience for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we forget as men that those hard times are the bonding agents in life, right? And yeah. I remember when um when Edie, my my three year old, was born, um, Lauren, it was like probably like day four or five. Lauren was just like in full blown postpartum. You know, the milk had just come in. She's still recovering from childbirth and she's not she hasn't slept very much. And um I remember her laying in bed next to me and she's crying. And she says, babe, I think I ruined our life <laughs> because the baby's not sleeping, you know, yeah. and having already done three kids before in my previous marriage, you know, mm-hmm. um, it was in that moment. It just, it, I just reminded her like, babe, this is where we actually bond. Like these hard times yeah. with the babies is where we really learn how to bond with them. And it's in those, the nighttime when the baby's crying and you get up and you don't want to get, and you're so tired, you're wrecked. And you just, you know, you're rocking the baby that you like, that's where you and the baby figure out this thing. And it's the same yeah. thing in marriage, right? And it's also the same thing that you're doing when you take guys into the wilderness and they're getting their ass kicked on a motorcycle that when that whole trip's done, it's the hard time that the guy looks back and goes, these things, this is what I came here for. A hundred percent. Type two fun. Type two fun, dude. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And marriage is just full of those different moments. I wanted to go back on something that you said, you said it so nonchalantly, um, but you talked about reframing the, the different situations that you get into that, to to change your perspective on that, to help you not dive into anxiety or um, even, even jumping into jealousy, things like that. Because I do think that one of the biggest challenges for human beings, but since we're talking about men, for men um, especially is one, feeling like they're not enough where they're at, feeling like they should be further along or feeling like they don't have what it takes, right? Like one, any yeah. one of those three things feels like, the enemy of the day for most men. I feel like I should be further along. So there's tons of criticism and judgment. I feel like I don't have what it takes in this, in this moment, you know, and in feeling like I'm not enough. And I think that you touched on reframing. And I think that's one of the biggest keys to life to make sure that you're staying in the present but also not telling yourself this story that's creating so much anxiety that's just burying you all day long. Because I think if you can't learn how to reframe, then we never will actually push into things that feel risky or dangerous or potentially overwhelming because it takes quite a bit of self-management and uh, risk management in order to, to go on a real adventure, in order to like live life to its fullest What's your mm-hmm. like go to as far as reframing? Yeah, I think there's a couple things like 
for reframing. Um, one, I guess, is just or like reorienting myself to God, right? So, like, am I trying to be in control of my life, or am I allowing, you know? it's not allowing God. Am I changing my perspective to remember that I'm not in control? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as that verse that says, you know, like man makes his plans, but the Lord determines his steps. Right. So it's like, yeah, we're supposed to make a plan and be walking, but the rest of it, man, is not up to us. You know? Yeah. If I think about business, like, Honestly, like pretty much all of like the greatest hits in business that I've had, I have had not, nothing to do with me. You know, it's just always how it is, right? Like the best opportunities, like they just show up and you're like, wow, okay, I'm thankful. But those don't show up unless you're moving, right? Like you have to be, uh, God honors momentum and movement, you know, like 100%, even if it's in the wrong direction. I think, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like a little kid is bowling, you know, you put the guards up and they think that they rule at bowling and the ball's just doing this all the way to the end. Like, I think that's what it's like, you know, yeah. is at least we're moving forward and we're just like slamming off those little bumpers, but we're slowly getting there. Um, so it's, that's one really important thing. It's just like a reframing of, okay, where like, I'm not, supposed to be like the buck doesn't actually stop with me here it can feel it can feel like this is 100 percent my responsibility i'm like being crushed under the weight of this responsibility anyone who's got lots of employees or lots of payroll or lots of anything you know has felt that before and it can really feel like it's all on you so it's like okay reorienting that and reminding yourself that like it's not just me um but I've got a role here. You know, I can't just sit back and wallow. So that's one thing. Um, another thing that's a really helpful thing for me, um, especially with the comparison of where am I not, I, I'm not there yet, that mindset, or, you know, I should be here. Um, it's really powerful to not, don't compare yourself with where you think you should be. You got to compare yourself to where you were a year ago. Mm. and. Obviously, sometimes in life, you can be in a worse spot today than you were in a year ago, maybe in lots of the big categories. But as a general concept, if I say, well, okay, a year ago in my business, man, I didn't have the motorcycle fleet that I actually wanted and they were breaking down like crazy. I had a bunch of old trucks that sucked and like I was really like I had, you know, we were really struggling to like come out of COVID and upturn, downturn. And like, it was, I had some interpersonal stress stuff with team member, like, so it's like reminding yourself like, man, what was life like a year ago can be a really powerful way to find a few things to be really grateful for, or a few things to encourage yourself. Be like, well, I may not have moved every single metric in my life forward, but actually this part of my life is better or I've got this new relationship now or whatever that might be. Um, so that's been really helpful. Um, you know, to compare yourself with yourself, not with a false version of yourself that doesn't exist, which is that's the five year you. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to be in five years or what I should be doing. Like that's a, that's an existential question that I don't want to lose sleep on. Um, so those are two simple like mindset things that actually really do help me. Um, I trying to, th I, I, I mean, I just, I don't know, trying to just not, I don't know. Some people are definitely more prone to being stressed out about everything than others, but like my business, like, man, there is so much that can go wrong in my business. Like every single weekend we got people doing dangerous stuff, you know, and get hurt and things can go wrong. And it's too much pressure and stress yeah. to bear if you're just like so focused on that and trying to control that, you know? So it's kind of like you got to ride the wave a little bit and, you know, you know, and kind of take each day as it comes. Yeah, uh, it's true. I think one of the, one of the tools that a friend taught me a long time ago was to recognize when you're being the judge and, and move yourself into being the scientist and not the judge. So like the judge and judge and jury says like, these are all the things you're doing wrong, but the scientist yeah. goes like, why are things going wrong? It's just like, there's no judgment. Yeah. 
It's just simply looking at the, the raw data, what's actually happening in your life. And I've recognized in my life, um, I think for me, it's, it's easy to compare myself to the other men that whatever share, I share a pulpit with, you know, and I've done that for yeah. a long time, preaching on stage. I'm, I'm preaching behind Bill and my dad and Danny. And it was easy in my younger years to, to start going like, man, <clears throat> why am I not that? Why am I not preaching like that? Why am I not doing that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I found like what helped me a ton there was instead of focusing on what I wasn't like getting back to my main mission. And I remember yeah. God me one time, like I got off stage and I felt, <clears throat> I felt pretty insecure because I knew I hadn't done a good job preaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I remember God telling me in the moment, he said, you're, you're asking yourself the wrong question. Cause I was asking like, how, how did I do, you know? And really I was just asking that because I wanted affirmation. He said, you're up here asking the wrong question. What I, what I want you to ask is, did I change anybody's life today? Yeah. Like, yeah. Who did you I, help? Was I faithful? And yeah. that, like that, that transition of, uh, of asking how well did I do as opposed to was I faithful was everything for me as a preacher and, mm-hmm. and helped me so much. And then I think too, like I had had all these big goals, um, especially like 2009, I had written a book and I just thought like, man, I'm going to write a book a year. And, you know, I had all these crazy goals for myself and I'd went through a nervous breakdown and I got remarried and was, you know, blending a family and went through a, a seven year infertility journey. And I got to like 37 years old and I, I caught myself looking at my life going like, man, what have I even accomplished? You know, I wasted all that time. I haven't written the books that I wanted to write. Yeah. And, and then like, I started to go back and go, well, what, what really happened in you? What is the real story? Well, the real story, because the story I was telling myself had no compassion in it. It just Mm. was, uh, had zero compassion for what was actually going on. And so when I started to actually go back and go like, well, I got remarried. That's a pretty big accomplishment. I blended a family. My kids are doing really well. I had to work them through a lot of pain. Like, uh, I, my wife and I walked through six years of infertility. Like there's some accomplishments there that if I'm not careful, I don't even celebrate the things that I have worked through. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and instead just go straight to like all the things that I haven't done. Yeah. And that, that judge, man, he, he, he wants to come and try to make you better. But uh shame is, is uh shame's a bad friend to keep around. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you were talking about risk a little bit. How do you guys, like, how do you mitigate the risk? Because in your business, there's tons. I mean, the, from the <laughs> motorcycles to the snowmobiles. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. starters, what's the worst thing that's ever happened? And then, but oh my really, gosh. how do you deal with all that stuff? Yeah. Well, hopefully my insurance company isn't listening. But, uh... <laughs> you don't have to share the worst thing. Yeah. No, no. You know, it, the worst part of the business is when people get hurt. Now that said, we've had a lot of people get mangled and come back and that's the best. Like that's bravery, right? Like, you know, they come back and they, they face their demons again and like they get back. And like, I love that. Um, you know, we've had, we've been really fortunate. I would say like, most of the bad stuff has been limited to like broken bones and things that can heal and do heal. You know, we've only had two helicopter evacuations, you know, in like 11 years, which is pretty good. That's a pretty good metric, you know, and those guys, they probably could have ridden out (laughs) weak. They were weak. They pressed the button, you know? Yeah. Suck it up. Come on. Walk it off. Um, no, but in, in managing that risk, I mean, obvi- we it's a fine line for us. Like, we're not a safety third organization, you know, yeah. but we have a line. Um, so one of, we've got these kind of like rules for guiding that we come up with. And one of the concepts is called secretly safe. So I want the customers to feel like this is dangerous and we're taking risks, real risk, give you enough rope to hang yourself with risk. 
but I want my staff and crew. And as a company, we want to know that they're actually within like a larger circle of real safety, but we would put breaking a bone on the inner circle. Whereas yeah. other people would say that's outside of the big circle, right? So if you're talking life and limb, like, yeah, we're very concerned about that, but it's really important in what we do and what we're trying to do for people and wake them up again is to let them feel real risk, bump up to real risk. That's what's incredible about even the motorcycle trips versus the UTV trips, you know, like the four wheelers, like a car, dune buggy. Um, the risk is really different on a motorcycle. It's in front of your face. You can't avoid it. You're, you're mitigating risk all day long on the bike. You're learning, you're getting better. And it just washes your brain clean. You have no time to think about work, no time to think about all this other crap. You're just, okay, rock, cactus, rock, tree, rut, like, and it, you're in a flow state for nearly four days in a row, wow. which is just unbelievable for your mind. And there's so much good that comes from it. So that's the, uh, that's kind of our goal, right? Secretly safe. Dude, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so good. Uh, it, I mean, so, so many things, like if you take the risk out of it, it's just no longer, it's no longer adventure, right? Like it doesn't do nope. the same thing. Totally. And it's more and more, you know, you look at like every single other goal of our life is to like increase comfort and reduce risk. So that's why these experiences really stand out for people as like a kind of a, a mile marker, a, a change point in their life. It's crazy how you see co guys come alive as soon as you add a little bit of risk to something. Yeah. Yeah. Like they come out of their shell. I, I took a bunch of guys. Um, we do this long range shooting school in Wyoming and it's uh, it's like 10,000 feet elevation. There's no cell service. So, you know, the phones are gone. <clears throat> and, but we do, um, horseback riding on part of it. Yeah. And it's in like some real, real terrain, like real wilderness, mountainous terrain, super dangerous, but the horses are incredible. And you take yeah. the guys on, on a bunch of the steep stuff where there's no trails and the horses <laughs> are just navigating through. And yeah. sometimes the guys gotta jump off because a horse can't freaking, you know, the horse can't go anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're like on fire. You bring guys back from that, they're on fire. They're lit up. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Like on nearly every one of our motorcycle routes, like there's always, there's a few like crux moments, you know, like a hard climb or like a really challenging stretch. Everyone's got to get through it. You're all lined up, a big hill climb, you know, everyone's cheering for each other. And it's like there is a palpable shift in the group dynamic after that experience every single time. Dude, that's incredible. Yeah. Man. Well, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I love what you're doing at Wilderness, and I would love for a bunch of our guys to jump on one of your trips. And the good, let's go. Leave it all out on the line with you. Yeah. And, and uh, whether it's the the motorcycle or I don't know, you guys do this cool trip in Alaska um, on the snowmobiles and things like that. But it'd be super cool to have have some of the guys jump on your trip and, and go lay it all out there. So, yeah. Well, you know where to find me. <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for your time, man. I appreciate it. Dude, likewise, man. It was great having a conversation with you and um, hoping that, you know, our paths cross again soon. Brave Co. Man, stay brave this week. We'll see you next time. Hey, Brave Co. Man. Hopefully you loved this week's episode. Listen, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, you are already behind. Go ahead and click right here to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have not watched last week's episode, you can click right here and watch last week's episode. And listen, if you want to upgrade your wardrobe, you can check out some of our new hats that we have in stock and all our other swag. Go to braveco.org and you can look at our store there. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.